Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of the team at CBRE, can I just say a huge thanks for taking the time uh, to join us here this morning. When I looked at the uh, weather forecast last night, I was wondering if, uh, if we'd see anybody here this morning, so we really do appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to come here this morning. I'd also like to take the opportunity to wish you and your families all the very best for 2018, for a happy and healthy uh, year ahead. For anybody that saw the uh, coverage of the Pendulum Summit last week, there's one uh, commitment that we're going to make this morning that none of the presenters will be uh, removing any of their shirts, so uh, you need, need to be uh, modest. Um, Marie will follow shortly with uh, her Outlook presentation, and then we will have John McGrain, the Director General of the British and Irish Chamber of Commerce, talk to us about Brexit, and I'm sure you'll find John's very insightful thoughts on this subject to be very interesting. Brexit obviously prove, is going to be a very, very topical subject in 2018, and I guess there's a lot of uncertainty around it, so John's views and insight would be really, really helpful. So, before we kick off, I'd like you to, uh, to watch a video of 2017, some of the uh, technology events that happened in that year, but unfortunately, not all for the good. So enjoy the video. Click on that link, the malicious software is downloaded and spreads rapidly through your network, locking up all the files on it. The irony is that security experts think a hacking tool allegedly leaked from America's National Security Agency in April may have been used by the attackers. The Health Service will point out that it's just one of many organizations around the world affected by this attack. But it now faces what could be a lengthy process of cleaning up its computers and making the network safe again. Yeah, nobody wants a hacker to be able to get into your documents. There are ways to protect yourself from cyber criminals. If you haven't got a good security suite on your, uh, your laptops and your tablets, you really need to be doing it. So what really drives this is more around, if they can continue to make money doing this, then they'll find the tools. We know that Ukraine appears to have also been a primary target. I mean, we're talking here about crucial infrastructure, central banks, airports. Government computers also locked up as so-called ransomware scrambled data until payment is made. Also affected Russia's state-run oil company, along with Danish shipping giant AP Moller Maersk and U.S. drug maker Merck and Company. Last month, a similar attack spread to 150 countries. While it's impossible to prevent an attack like this, there are measures that can be taken to reduce the risk. I guess for anybody uh, who's wondering what their teenage children are doing up in their bedroom when they're up there for hours, let's hope they're not involved in, in hacking. So, yeah, cybersecurity, big, big topic last year, but we all work in the property industry, so, you know, where's the relevance for us? Surely, you know, cybersecurity, that's for the, uh, the IT guys to, uh, to worry about. Nothing could be further from the truth. Our buildings, design, operation, setup, and how we manage and occupy these buildings is increasingly going high-tech and IP-enabled. Technologies hugely are improving the efficiency and functionality of the modern office building. Therein lies the problem. All IP-enabled technologies can be hacked. So, how safe is your building? What is vulnerable? The building management system, the fire alarm, lifts, heating and air conditioning, sprinkler system, and the security system. Let's look at the potential vulnerability and how it could impact. We will look first at the security system. The camera system within your building can easily be accessed, allowing third parties to view videos of people entering your building, and then using advanced facial recognition techniques that enable them to identify those people. In the majority of cases, this won't cause anything other than a minor irritant. But in some scenarios, the visitors to your business could disclose the possibility 
of a large corporate deal such as a merger, with significant money to be made from being aware of this sensitive information. Probably of more concern is the threat to destroy your fire alarm or lift controls. Doing this would make it impossible to occupy your building until a new system is installed, which could take weeks. As an occupier, can you take such a risk? Think of a shopping center and how losing control of your M&E services could create huge havoc and huge inconvenience. Or how would you deal with a threat to have your sprinkler system set off, causing panic and result in significant damage, costing hundreds of thousands or more? The threat is real and will impact all properties, from offices to hotels to retail, industrial and residential. Maintenance engineers come in regularly to service such much of this equipment. How are these companies' security systems and practices checked? It is so easy to infect equipment with a virus that could lay dormant and be activated at any time in the future or cause huge damage immediately. So, what's to be done? Buildings are currently rated for energy efficiency but it won't be long before buildings will get a cybersecurity rating, and arguably, it will be the most important rating the building will have. Currently, occupiers are grappling with cybersecurity and how it impacts their business. Many of you will be aware of the Maginot Line, a huge defensive line built by France after the First World War to defend our border. But the aggressor took the back door in, totally negating the value of the defensive line. Occupiers up to now have been looking at their own internal systems and firewalls, putting security walls up to protect the systems and area that they occupy. But many occupiers will now start looking at the building they occupy and how cyber secure they are, especially so in multi-let buildings. Occupying a building at risk could result in occupiers being denied access to the building due to health and safety risks after a cyber attack. How damaging would this be to an occupier? As owners, occupiers and managers of buildings, we need to be proactive in ensuring our buildings set the highest standards of cybersecurity. At CBRE, we are partnered with Johnson Controls, specialists in smart building technologies, and together we can survey your building to establish and identify any vulnerabilities and produce a plan to address these risks. It is likely that we will first see such a cyber attack on a building in one of the world's larger cities, but that's no reason to be complacent. So don't be surprised to hear occupiers and investors asking the cyber question over the coming years. Our buildings are at risk and are vulnerable, but we can secure them by minimizing the risk, and these are the buildings that the occupiers will want to occupy. Thank you very much. Santa, good morning everybody. We're here this morning to launch what is the 29th edition of our Outlook report and you'll all get copies of the document as you leave this morning. Um, one of the quotes that came to mind when I was thinking of, of, of this year's report was from Warren Buffett and this was very topical this morning when the weather is so bad but it's very, very easy to look in the rearview mirror and look at what happened in the year gone by. It's much more difficult to try and look ahead and predict what's likely to happen, particularly in uncertain times like we're in at the moment. Um, looking backwards is, is relatively easy for CBRE because we spend so much time on data and tracking um, activity, so we have very good information on what happened in the past. I think that the challenge is to try to figure out how to use that to look ahead and see what might happen in the year ahead. So a little bit of rear view mirror looking first, looking at 2017 in terms of summarising the year. And many of you who are here last year will remember us saying it's going to be busy, but a different kind of busy. And I think if you think of last year, that really bore out because it was a lot of transactional activity, but transaction volumes in many sectors of the market were down on the previous years. We had come through three extraordinary years between 2014 and 2016 when we were in the midst of deleveraging and NAMA were deleveraging 
deleveraging, there was lots of portfolio sales. 2017 was different because the deleveraging had virtually come to an end and sourcing product was much more difficult. So in many sectors of the market, transaction volumes were down on the previous years. We also saw total returns coming in at a lower rate. Now, prior to the stamp duty changes, which came unexpected in the budget, we had had um, 8 to 10 percent penciled in for total returns for 2017. And next week, the IPD will have their numbers out for what that figure came in at. And suffice to say, it will be less than 8 to 10 percent, simply because of that stamp duty change. It was the second unexpected tax change in the space of two years, and it certainly affected sentiment. It affected pension fund values and quarterly valuations in Q4, but thankfully it didn't seem to dampen investor demand for opportunities in Ireland, which is good. We also had a very strong economic backdrop, and again, we don't have final year numbers for the year yet, but it looks like GDP growth of about 4.5% or slightly more than that. The Irish Exchequer had its first surplus since 2006, and we created 55,000 new jobs. And I suppose to put that in perspective, if you look around you this morning, there's about 800 people in the room. So that's 70 RDS halls full of people. That's the amount of new jobs that were created in Ireland last year. And obviously that's a huge boon for the commercial real estate sector. And I think in this instance, the IDA and Enterprise Ireland have to be commended for the Trojan work that they are doing in promoting Ireland and helping us to win all of these jobs. Investor demand, as I said, was very, very strong, and right throughout 2017, we saw new entrants coming into the market. We also saw yields um, being relatively attractive compared to the rest of Europe. So if we watch European yields right throughout 2017, they continued to compress. In Ireland's case, they stayed quite flat, and it was really only in the latter part of the year that we saw some yield compression in the office and the multifamily built to rent sector, but for the most part, they stayed flat. So there was quite an arbitrage there between Irish yields and what was prevailing in many of the other capitals around Europe, which are at all-time lows. Um, we also had the highest arbitrage between government bonds um, compared to the rest of Europe, about a 300 basis point differential between prime office yields and 10-year bonds. So Ireland was relatively attractive compared to these other capitals. And we also had very, very strong occupier market activity. And that obviously is very attractive to investors. So we had very strong activity in the retail sector, in the industrial. But the office sector was really the, the best performer, the best in class, with um, an absolute record level of take-up being achieved. In terms of development, we saw a lot more cranes on the horizon, and again, this activity was very much focused on the offices sector, but we also saw some new development in terms of student accommodation, hotels, some industrial starting to commence, and some residential, albeit nowhere near the sort of volumes needed. So what will 2018 bring? Um, I think we mentioned last year that the three drivers to be really mindful of were economics, tax and politics. And I think that certainly bore out whether you're talking about the local economy, tax and politics, if you're talking from a European perspective or indeed from an international global perspective. So conditions now are relatively benign. And we, I suppose, have accepted that the period of exceptional growth that we've come through in the last couple of years has come to an end. Ireland will continue to outperform for the fifth year running. We're going to create 50,000 new jobs in 2018. And Europe is largely positive as well. But there are things to be mindful of. We need to be mindful of the international environment. Um, CBRE's house view would be that we're probably going to have a cyclical downturn in the US in either late 2019 or early, 2000, or early 2020. That, in turn, will see an end to this QE that we have been so dependent on over the last couple of years and an eventual um, unwinding of that. And ultimately, that means that interest rates will start to, to go up. Um, the QE, I suppose, the ECB are currently buying half the amount of bonds that they were buying originally under that programme, so they're beginning to wean us off that. And there is some talk that by the time we get to year end, that they may um, finish the bond buying exercise that we have been used to over the last couple of years. 
In terms of interest rates, we've already seen some movement in, in the US, but we're going to have a new um, Fed um, representative, Jer Jerome Powell, taking over from Janet Yellen in, in the coming weeks. And it will be interesting to see what his policy will be in terms of interest rate moves. The, the expectation is that there will be at least two interest rate hikes in the US over the course of this year and possibly more. Once interest rates start to arrive, arise, that in turn will have implications for the market. So it's something to be mindful of. But I suppose it's our house view that European interest rates are unlikely to change dramatically during 2018 at least. In terms of tax, um, I suppose we, we've talked a lot about Trump over the last 12 months and a lot of people felt that the tax reform would not go through, but it did. And corporation tax in the US now gone from 35% to 21%. Now obviously our 12 and a half is still more attractive, but you would be naive to assume that it's not going to have any impact on our market. It will have an effect and the expectation is that it might dampen demand in terms of new investors coming in. Um, also, I think from a tax perspective, we've been saying it for many years now, but Ireland's reliance on our 12.5% corporation tax just has to end. We need to look at other elements of our offer, be it talent, infrastructure, and focus on those because we can no longer rely solely on our 125 There's going to be more pressure coming, particularly from Europe, over the next 12 months on, on, that, um, on that topic. And obviously Brexit then is another issue that we're going to hear more about. We're probably tired listening to it at this stage, but we've at least another 14 months until we get to March 2019. And obviously we're going to get um, some views from John um, later um, this morning about that. So in terms of the best performing or the best in class, um, the office market last year was just phenomenal. Um, we had the best year ever, as I said, 331,000 square meters of take up or 3.5 million square feet. And the previous, I suppose, annual average had been around 2 million square feet. So a phenomenal performance and the vacancy rate coming down to just over 6%. So to summarize some of the key points, take-up was over a third higher than the previous peak, which was 2007. Three quarters of the deals were less than 10,000 square feet. So we're still seeing a lot of small deals making up the bulk of the market, but we had eight transactions greater than 100,000 square feet. So we had both extremes last year, lots of small deals, but a handful of very large deals, which obviously boosted the take-up numbers. 21 pre-lettings, um, several large lettings, as I said, and most of the activity coming from expansions or relocations. Very few new entrants. And where we did see new entrants, they tended to be quite small. The larger deals were predominantly expansion activity, companies already having a presence here. And I suppose pre-letting, just to explain that, um, they're not pre-lettings in, in the true sense, in that people are committing to signing leases on buildings that are still a, a drawing on a map. Um, most of these lettings were mid-construction or in some cases nearing end completion when they were signed, but they're technically called pre-lettings. But we think over the course of 2018, we're going to see more true pre-lettings starting to emerge. 44% of the take-up last year was to tech companies, so that would be higher than what we had, been, had seen in previous years where it was 30%. It was skewed by some of the very large deals that happened during the last 12 months, and we did see a layer of Brexit-related demand, and there's some debate about that as to whether we're getting anything on the back of Brexit, but actually it has added a very welcome layer of demand and some very significant deals announced over the course of the year, and indeed a lot of shadow Brexit announcements as well, where they're not necessarily appearing on the front page of the papers as a Brexit-related transaction, but in reality they're Brexit-related. When we look at the makeup of take-up, um, the volume of, of leasing activity by UK companies more than doubled year on year. So that tells us that yes, Brexit is having an effect on, on the Dublin market. The pace of rental growth eased, so we continue to see prime headline rents rise. They rose by over 4% year on year. They reached 700 euro per square meter by year end, or 65 euro per square foot. But what's interesting if you look at the chart is when you analyze all of the deals that happened, the, an the average rent that was paid in Dublin 2 and 4 was 518, which is about um, 48 euro per square foot. 
If we look at the average for the market as a whole, it came in at about 38 euro per square foot. So that tells us if we're focusing on rents, we shouldn't really be focusing on the headline number. That's just the absolute top prime rent that's paid. But I think the, the underlying piece about the office market last year was just the quality of the tenant profile, excellent quality, and about 200,000 square meters of new stock built. So again, just to put that in perspective, 331,000 square meters less, 200,000 of new stock built. So that to us doesn't look like oversupply. So what will 2018 bring? We're expecting a similar year in terms of very strong activity. We're seeing, um, expecting, because of the, the mandates that are out there that are live at the moment, a lot of them are tech and financial services related, that they will translate into letting activity and we will see some pre-letting activity. And we're going to see the Brexit effect solidify. So we're going to see a lot of the companies that are currently looking at different options and viewing buildings, making a firm decision and, and picking a building and signing in lease deals. We're going to see a lot more focus on flexibility and co-working. And I suppose this is something that probably wasn't even on our radar 12 months ago. 15% of all the take-up in London in the last 12 months was to, to co-working companies. 5% of take-up in Dublin this year or last year was to companies like Iconic, Huckletree, WeWork. And we're going to hear more of these. So we have a lot more... Um, Tenants looking for more flexibility of space, looking for expansion space. We have companies um, willing to put some of their operations into flexible models. So it is something as landlords that we do need to become much more familiar with. And there has to be a trust here that this sector is working in other markets and it does have longevity. We saw a lot more activity in the provinces. So we saw a lot of activity in Cork. We saw a lot of activity in Limerick, in Galway, and some of these other cities, which will in turn kickstart some new development. And only last week, there was the announcement from Jaguar, um, a deal that we were involved in down in Shannon, creating 150 new jobs in that region. So it's not all Dublin focused. Um, our expectation for rental growth is because rents, uh, the headline rents have now reached 700 euro per square meter, we're not predicting that they're going to change to any great degree over the course of the next 12 months. So the greatest rental growth that will be achieved in 2018 is going to be in the suburbs or it's going to be in provincial locations. And in fact, in Cork, we're expecting prime office rents there to rise by more than 10% year on year. Supply, in our view, is very well controlled. And I suppose just to illustrate this, we don't have a lot of charts for you this morning, but I thought this was an important one. The green bars on here is take up over the last couple of years. And again, you can see outperformance in 2017. And the pink is what we think is going to be delivered in 2018, 19, and 20. So that to us doesn't look like oversupply. 240,000 square meters of stock due for delivery this year, and that was only updated this week. The document that you'll get on the way out might say 270, but when we updated it this week, some of the 2018 stock has fallen into 2019. So 240,000 is our figure. And what's particularly encouraging about that is 37% of that stock that's going to be finished this year has already been pre-let. So that tells us that the market in supply is, is very well controlled. There are schemes in planning now in Cork, in Limerick, in Galway, so it's encouraging that there is now stock and um, availability starting to come through, so we would expect to see quite a bit of provincial activity over the next 12 months. But I think scarcity of stock is, is likely to continue to prevail for the next 12 months. So moving to the retail sector, um, there have been undertones of negativity creeping into the, the conversation in terms of retail in the last while. There's a lot of discussion about leakage to Northern Ireland um, because of the sterling euro differential. There's a lot of leakage to UK websites and a movement to online in general. And I suppose last week um, we had the announcement from Forever 21, the US retailer, that they were leaving Jervis Shopping Centre, their only Irish store. So this has added to the, the negativity that's out there. Conventional retail is um, under huge pressure, but that's not to say it's all negative. In fact, if you look at footfall, if you look at sentiment, retail sales activity, both in value and volume terms, and indeed occupier activity, the story in, in our, our 
but mind is that that's still quite strong. We still have a lot of retailers vying to get space and find opportunities in the Irish market. But it is fair to say that that pool of retailers that are looking for stock is smaller than it what once was. The UK um, retailers are less active because obviously they're concerned about Brexit and what that might mean, so they're being a little bit cautious. The fashion retailers have retrenched a little bit. But there were lots of new entrants to the market last year. We saw people like Hotel Chocolat going into Dundrum, Victoria's Secrets opening on Grafton Street, Home Sense, Smiggle, Urban Decay, new names opening their first stores in the Irish market, and obviously the Ivy, which will be a very big boon for the Molesworth Street, Dawson Street area when that opens. So good to see new entrants, and what was, um, I suppose, particularly encouraging for us is every single one of those new entrants, CBRE, were involved in, in the deal. Um, food and beverage has really been the, the primary driver, and if you think about the new stores that have opened in the various high streets and shopping centres, it has been very much led by food and beverage. We've also had a lot of activity from beauty retailers, leisure, but the one thing that we have noticed is that fashion is not as active as it once was. And what we have noticed as well, be it from an occupier or indeed an investor viewpoint, is that there's much more focus now on the better performing streets, the better performing shopping centres. And one thing that we've really noticed is a very significant activity in retail parks. And I suppose that's not surprising considering the economic backdrop. People have more money in their pockets, so they tend to, to, to spend. And also with the increase in home building, um, that's driving demand for the types of occupiers that typically occupy retail parks. So they They've been doing quite well. So we're not overly negative in, in, in terms of retail and in fact the biggest challenge last year was a scarcity of premises in the actual schemes that people want to, to locate in. 40 transactions or more than 40 were completed in the Dublin M50 shopping centres um, between them over the course of the last 12 months and it would have been considerably higher than that if there were units available in these schemes. So what will 28 team bring, I suppose the most significant thing is it will bring new supply and that has been the big bugbear of the market for the last couple of years, talking to retailers coming into the market, they want to go into new schemes and we will finally see some new supply starting to come on stream. All of the M50 shopping centres, including the, the Square, which traded recently, have either planning permissions in place or have applied for planning permission for extensions and refurbishment programmes, so that will be encouraging. And I suppose this isn't something that's unique to Ireland because right across Europe all our colleagues are telling us that many shopping centres are expanding their footprint. In some cases it's to put a food and beverage offer into the shopping centre, but really it's to work on placemaking and to increase dwell times and increase footfall. If we look at rental growth, there wasn't significant rental growth in the retail sector last year. We're expecting that we will see some coming through this year, but it will be concentrated on the better streets and it will be concentrated on the schemes that are being managed actively. Um, the days of talking about secondary and provincial retail as if they were all the same are gone and we, we really feel looking at secondary and provincial schemes now, they have to be analysed individually and taken on their own merits and absolutely the ones that are being managed well will perform well. Um, any of the ones that are not being um, managed well, I think rental growth will be elusive in, in those particular schemes. And we're going to see a lot more focus on multi-channel. And I suppose this is no surprise to anybody, but um, a lot of the retailers now really improving their offer in terms of having an online offer and many um, online retailers who never had a physical store looking for physical stores. So that's proving you do need to have both um, channels. One of the facts I was reading about over Christmas which I thought was interesting is that on Black Friday this year in Ireland, people bought more on their phones than they did on PCs, tablets and laptops together. So we're shopping more on the go on our phones and um, there's a blurring of the lines between physical retail and online retail. And I think equally there's a blurring of the lines between retail and industrial now because of the distribution and the omni-channel and um, e-commerce fulfilment that we all keep reading about. The biggest challenge in industry last year was a shortage of stock. There was almost 250,000 square metres of take-up, which is, is a decent level of activity, but it would have been considerably higher had there been modern stock available, and that was the biggest challenge. 
Um, just over half of the activity was lettings, quite a bit of buying activity going on, very, very strong demand for land, and very strong demand for um, design and build. And if you think of any of the construction that's underway in this particular sector, it has been predominantly design and build. There's only a handful of speculative development schemes underway. And this was the sector that saw the highest rental growth. So we had 6% growth in rents um, to 99.50 per square metre or 9.25 per square foot. So we're at a point now where development is actually economically viable. And for that reason, we would expect to see more development coming on stream. So that the key trend for 2018 is that we're finally going to see some new supply coming on stream. There are three speculative schemes underway at the moment, two in North Dublin up near the airport and one along the the N7, but we're going to see more. We think there'll be an improvement in supply, but most of that supply is not going to get delivered anytime soon. It's going to take a while to build it, so in the interim, rents are going to continue to rise, and in fact, we think rents are going to grow another euro per square foot up to 10.25 over the next 12 months, so that's an 11% growth. So industrial is certainly going to be the best performing rental growth sector again in 2018, and that in turn will pique the interest of investors looking at this sector. Um, significant shortages of zoned and service sites, so that's a huge challenge. And I suppose something to be mindful of as well is a lot of the older industrial estates within the core of Dublin are um, increasingly being earmarked for higher value uses. So they're going to disappear, and that's going to make the shortage of zoned and service sites even more challenging over the next while. Um, from a design perspective, um, we're continuing to see huge focus now on automation within um, within the actual buildings and mechanization. Um, so the way people are using these buildings is changing. So the new stock that's going to come on stream is going to be like something we haven't seen before. And we're also seeing a huge appetite as well for higher eaves heights. So 12 meters eaves heights is now becoming the norm in buildings over 3,000 square meters and more, um, which is, is considerably higher than what would have been the case in the past, but that's becoming commonplace. Um, online retail, I mentioned the blurring of the lines between retail and industrial. This is certainly boosting demand. And speaking to our UK colleagues only last week, one third of all of the leasing activity in the UK industrial market now comes from either online sales or e-commerce fulfillment. Now, we're nowhere near there, but we're heading in that direction. And I think particularly with Brexit, um, I was being interviewed on News Talk this morning and the CEO of Dublin Port was there and he was talking about um, the trucks coming in and all of the distribution coming in from China and different places. We're seeing lots of appetite now for people to have their own facilities and distribution in Ireland as opposed to chancing what might happen in a Brexit scenario in terms of bringing their goods through the ports or bringing them down across the border from Northern Ireland. So we see that as going to drive demand for more modern distribution facilities and particularly as we move towards next day delivery and last mile collection. In terms of demand from investors, I suppose the biggest challenge every year is trying to find the product. But if we're saying that we're now going to start building new product, we're going to be creating new investable um, industrial logistics products. So there will be very strong demand from investors to purchase industrial. Um, I suppose the lease accounting rules have now come into place where all leases have to be put, the full lease has to be put on a balance sheet, and for some that might drive them to want to buy their premises as opposed to lease them, but we're still anticipating reasonably strong demand from, um, from a leasing perspective. So moving to investment, um, again a very strong year, there's a lot of negative headlines because the total volume of activity was down significantly year on year, but if anything it was, it was busier than the previous years, but I suppose that the key difference being that a lot of the transactions were smaller, there weren't big portfolio sales to drive the results, so instead of four and a half billion, we came in at just over two and a half billion, so a very significant drop year on year. But what we would say is that two and a half billion is probably a more normalized level of trading for the Irish market as opposed to the extraordinary three year period we went through between 2014 and 2016 when we were trading um, very, very strong levels. The largest transaction was the sale of the square, which came in at 233 million. Um, if we look at total returns, I've already mentioned it's going to be affected and next week, I think next Thursday, we're going to have actual numbers in terms of what the total return came in at, but it would have been affected by that stamp duty change. But thankfully, despite 
the unexpected nature of that. Um, the demand for core product didn't wane at all. And we saw very, very strong demand coming from lots of different sources. And as I said, lots of new entrants. And when you ask investors why, why Ireland, they will typically cite the economic backdrop, the strength of occupier activity, the potential for rental growth. But more important than any of that, they say the, the yield profile or the pricing relative to the rest of Europe is particularly attractive. And it's a combination of all of those that make Ireland um, attractive to them. And over the course of the last 12 months, something that we pointed to last, um, last year, and it certainly bore out, was this increasing appetite for alternative investment. So purpose-built student accommodation, healthcare, senior living, and built to rent, or PRS, as, as some people call it. And if we look at the makeup of take-up last year, or the spend, um, offices and retail still account for the, the lion's share, over 30% of activity each. But if we look at something like um, residential, it made up 9% of the investment spend last year. I think it was 3% the previous year. So absolutely, built to rent is starting to emerge as a very, very dominant force and almost becoming mainstream in its own right. The other one to look at there is the blue, which is hotels. Um, typically, hotels, we count in a separate pot because they're trading assets, but there were five hotels sold as investments last year, so that's starting to, to become um, a feature of the market as well. So what's our outlook for this year? I suppose our key underlying theme today is that we are approaching late cycle in many respects, but there's still some way to go. It's very much tied to the interest rate cycle. And as I said, US interest rates are rising, but we're not expecting that European interest rates will rise any time yet. So that bodes well. We're in this extended late cycle. In terms of volume, we're probably likely to see a similar volume, two and a half billion sort of level again in 2018. Um, very, very strong demand, but I think the focus is going to shift because people's appetite towards risk is going to change um, in this environment. And we're going to be doing a lot of research, I'd imagine, on income generation on tenant risk, security of income, and the potential for voids. These are the sort of issues that are going to exercise the minds of, of investors in, in 2018. In terms of what sectors, we think offices, obviously, for, for obvious reasons, is going to be very, very dominant. Logistics buildings and built to rent. Um, that 9% proportion in 2017 is going to be considerably higher if all of the deals that we think are going to happen this year um, come to fruition. Um, speaking of build to rent, um, the Urban Land Institute produced a very good document last year, and I'm not saying that because I was involved in, in, in writing part of it, but it was a collaboration that was done by ULI, and it's called the Build to Rent Guide for Ireland, and it's kind of the Bible for anybody who's investing in build to rent in this market, and there's going to be some copies of it available um, as you leave today. We don't have a lot of them, but it is available to, to buy from Urban Land Institute and on their website as well. Um, it's usually 25 euros but Andy Kinsler tells me he's selling them for 20 euro today so they will be um, available on the way out if there's anyone with a particular interest in build to rent um, a very very good guide to, to that particular sector so we're going to see lots of new entrants coming in and we saw some bidders coming from the Asian markets in 2017 so we expect that those bidders will come back again and we will see some Asian deals we've seen a lot of appetite from Korea in particular and I suppose these are investors that have been looking seriously and doing deals in London for some time and indeed regional UK so it's only a step further for them to, to look specifically at Dublin so I suppose watch that space for the, for the next 12 months and we also see increased demand for provincial opportunities. And we had many investor clients who, up until last year, only focused on Dublin, but began to look a little bit further afield in 2018. And we saw a lot of appetite for Cork in particular. So these are investors who heretofore would not have looked at these markets or, in, or considered opportunities. And now, considering the fact that yields um, are even more attractive once you move out of the Dublin market, we expect to see that picking up. Capital gains tax, there was some changes to that in the budget. Um, specifically, if you had an asset that you held for seven years, you could sell it then at the end of the seven-year period without having a liability to CGT. That seven-year period was brought into four years. So we could see that releasing more stock 
over the next 12 months as some assets that maybe weren't going to be brought to the market quite yet will be released in 2018 instead. So I suppose that could help to um, improve this, the stock scenario because if we had to identify the biggest challenge for 2018, it's probably deploying capital. And in fact, um, in our office, we, we often talk about it's easier to, to raise capital in some instances than it is to deploy it, considering the scarcity of um, product. But I think build to rent certainly one to, to be very, very mindful. It has huge defensive characteristics. It has the potential for stable, long-term income. So it's going to suit the profile of many of these investors that are looking for wealth preservation opportunities in the Irish market. When we think of development, I suppose anyone that's reading the newspapers or following the housing crisis um, would assume that there would have been a huge amount of development land traded in 2017. But in actual fact, um, it came in at, at, at similar volumes to the previous year, about 750 million. So three quarters of a billion, it's not um, a small figure, but most of the transactions were relatively small lot sizes. Now there were things like the RTE lands, which would have been exceptions to that, but most of the transactions quite small in nature. So I suppose frustrating considering the housing crisis that we're in, um, that there isn't more land being traded. Um, sourcing product proved to be a huge challenge. And I suppose Minister Owen Murphy has a huge challenge on his hands to try and turn this around and get more supply coming into the system. There were some welcome changes to the planning policy um, over the last 12 months that are to be commended. And in particular, the change whereby if you're applying for planning for more than 100 residential units, you go straight to onboard Planola as opposed to going through the normal planning process. That only started last September. And as of last week, on board Planola say that they have 11 cases in front of them at the minute with a combined 4,000 houses and that they all have to be decided on imminently. So that seems to be working and, and that is to be welcomed. In terms of 2018, um, I suppose what we would feel is that there's going to be more depth to the market. Um, it's not going to be one particular type of buyer looking for land. You have people looking for public housing, you have people looking for land for private housing, you have purpose-built student accommodation providers, build to rent and PRS providers, people looking for land to build commercial stock. So all of these are going to be competing with each other, so there's going to be considerable depth and considerable demand for any sites that are brought to the market. And we would say that this is the optimum time to bring sites to the market if anyone's sitting there on lots of land, because there is this pent-up demand there for this land, and we, we think it's the optimum time to bring that out. The sector is obviously becoming much more professionalised. We have two listed vehicles now in this particular space and the possibility of, of more to come. Um, there's a huge volume of international capital and a lot of that focused on the build to rent sector. And that was, I suppose, illustrated very clearly last week with the news that the Dutch investor APG have done a joint venture with Heinz to develop 1,100 build to rent units out in, in Cherrywood. So we're going to see more of that um, wall of international capital vying to get into the market here. We expect we're also going to see a lot more collaboration. And I suppose what we mean by this is um, state bodies, um, local authorities, bringing land to the market via joint ventures or license agreements, not necessarily selling to a third party, but being involved in the project themselves. There were some examples of that last year with CIE, Diageo, for example. So we would expect to see more of that starting to happen over the next 12 months, and that would be hugely welcome because it's key to unlocking some of the strategic sites in our cities that we so desperately need to develop at this point in time. Again, this is a sector where the changes to CGT might release some more product. And also, we now have the site value tax, which is in operation since the 1st of January. And that in might encourage or force some developers to bring land to the market, um, simply because the 3% rate that prevails from the 1st of January of this year goes to 7% as of the 1st of January next year. So that might be an incentive for some people to, to bring that land to market now. Um, in terms of policy, as I said, we're hugely supportive of what the Minister is trying to do. Um, we were particularly encouraged by the design document that was released a number of, or before Christmas. Um, anyone that wants to make an observation on that have two days left because the 18th of January is, is the deadline for submissions. But in that document, they talk about re relaxing density, relaxing design, 
um, talking about increasing building heights in certain locations. So it's an excellent report, but I suppose we're tired of reports now. We need action. We need it implemented. And as a developer, you're not going to lodge an application or get on site developing a scheme today if there's an expectation that the law is going to change in a matter of weeks or months. So we need a decision on that sooner rather than later. In terms of hotels, um, again, this is a sector where transactional activity was down year on year. Instead of the um, 800 million plus that would have traded in more than 60 transactions in the previous year, there were 36 hotel sales in Ireland, 400 million plus between them. And on top of that, then there were the five investment sales that I mentioned. So transaction volume significantly down. And the main reason for that is there wasn't really a big Dublin sale. Now, people talk about the Gibson Hotel. That was one of the investment deals, so it's not counted in, in the numbers. But in the absence of having any large Dublin assets changing hands, the volumes were significantly down. The underlying backdrop was very, very healthy. Dublin was one of the best performing tourist markets in the world last year with Revpar and average room rate and all the various measures for hotels all performing particularly well. Um, we had 10.6 million visitors to Ireland last year. And what's remarkable about that number is that the UK numbers were down significantly, down 7 or 8 percent or more year on year because of sterling. And yet we were able to um, match that with an increase in activity from Europe and the US, and our numbers are actually higher year on year. And interestingly, again, in the interview on, with Dublin Port this morning, they talked about visitor numbers from the UK being up, coming in through Dublin Port, but that is an anomaly because if you talk to any of the tourist industries or look at the tourist stats, the UK numbers have been severely affected because of Brexit and what's happened to Stirling since. So it really is to be commended that we've been able to turn that around. Very, very strong demand for hotels, and I suppose huge frustration there from international buyers who are really focused on Dublin, that there hasn't been enough product coming through to enable them to get their hands on the hotels that they're looking for. And obviously a huge amount of planning activity as well, and some development activity happening too. So up to 500 million is what we would expect to see trading in 2018. We have some visibility on what hotels are coming to the market and our expectation is that there will be Dublin hotels tra trained hands this year and the CGT will also have an effect in this space and maybe encourage some hoteliers to bring their hotels to the market sooner than they might have originally intended. We're going to see an increase in development activity in Dublin, but also in other cities. And there's quite a, an opportunity there from international investors to get involved in forward funding and forward purchasing some of these schemes, which will unlock that development. Um, 1,400 rooms due for delivery in Dublin in 2018, and about 1,800 by our reckoning for 2019. So it's, it's, a, it's a decent level of stock. But again, it's nowhere near the volume that's needed because Dublin is completely undersupplied in terms of hotel rooms. And we expect to see more investment sales in this space as well. And I suppose one point we wanted to make is that planning does not mean under construction. So a lot of the negative publicity is focusing on the amount of hotels that are in the planning process. The reality in terms of what's physically under construction is quite different because just because you have a grant of planning doesn't necessarily mean you can go straight away on site. You have to get that scheme funded or a forward funding or a forward purchasing deal agreed in advance. So I would focus on what's in the construction phase as opposed to what's actually in the planning process. And I suppose we couldn't finish talking about hotels without mentioning the 9% VAT rate. I think the hotel industry was relieved on budget day that the government didn't change this. There was an expectation it was going to go back up, um, even incrementally back up to the 13.5%. It was left unchanged, but I think it would be unrealistic to assume that the same will happen in budget 2019. The likelihood is it will start to, to creep back up because it's deemed that this sector has recovered sufficiently. Dublin pubs. Um, not a lot of activity in this sector last year. There were 20 pubs changed hands in the course of the year compared to over 38 or something like that the previous year, 22 million. Um, transaction very, very subdued, um, despite the fact that there's a lot of appetite there, particularly for city centre pubs. Um, the challenge here is, is probably there's good and bad. The, the reason why a lot of pubs weren't traded is because they're performing very well. 
um, because of the economic backdrop, because of the tourist numbers, they're, they're very profitable and um, their turnover numbers are up and obviously that means the value is up so there's less propensity then to, to sell and also a lot of the pub owners were able to refinance their portfolios so they were under less pressure to sell as well so it's, it's kind of a sign of the times, the reason why there wasn't more traded. So our, our expectation is going to be an increase in that. We have some visibility as well in terms of some assets that are coming to the market this year. And again, it's one where the CGT changes might have an effect. There's pent up demand for the city centre in particular, but we're also seeing very strong demand for good suburban pubs that might be coming for sale over the next while. And again, any of the pubs, even if they're not trading, they seem, seem to be investing in capital expenditure and refurbishment, and that's good. And we would also expect to see a couple of new pubs opening over the next while. Um, and I suppose this is really in the hotel projects that are underway at the moment. All of them will have new pubs in their premises. So an, an interesting sector to watch. In terms of the Cork market, and this is my final segment, you'll, you'll be happy to hear, um, this is a picture of our own building in Cork because we opened a new Cork office during 2017 and we did that because we could see that there was huge appetite there both from an occupier and an investor viewpoint. Um, we would say transaction volumes in the Cork market would have been considerably higher last year had there been more product, and that's true of occupier and investor activity. Um, a shortage of stock was the, the number one issue. We saw significant growth in both offices and industrial, not to the same degree in retail, um, and a huge increase in planning activity and much more visibility on development. So there's quite a lot of schemes in planning in Cork at the moment um, in terms of office schemes. I think there's four cranes in the city centre at the moment, so it's obviously a, a drop in the ocean compared to Dublin. But for Cork, that's good because 12 or 18 months ago there were no cranes on the horizon. Um, in terms of new entrants, I've already mentioned um, from an investor viewpoint, we had investors doing deals in Cork last year that heretofore didn't look at, at the Cork market, so that was encouraging to see. And we're very encouraged by what 2018 looks like, um, particularly for the office sector. There's quite a bit of appetite there. There's several requirements outstanding, a couple of mandates that have to be fulfilled. So there will be pre-letting activity happening in Cork this year, and that will unlock some of that supply and enable some of the schemes that have a grant of planning at the moment to move on site and com for construction to commence. Um, but I suppose it takes some time to develop these buildings, so there's not necessarily going to be a lot of stock av available in 2018. Supply is going to remain quite tight, and that means that rents are going to continue to grow. And that's why we are expecting a 10% uplift in Cork prime rents over the next 12 months. So they're going to go up to 32.50 per square foot, or 350 euro per square metre. We're also expecting an uplift in industrial rents. And in terms of investment activity, there's potential for yields to harden. So we're in a market, in Dublin in particular, where there's very little room for more yield movement. And yet in the provincial markets, there is room for, for yield movement. So we're saying that office yields in Cork, which are currently at about 6%, have potential to come in by at least 25 basis points. And industrial, which are at 8%, have potential to come in by 50 basis points over the next 12 months. So that, in turn, will encourage investor appetite for that sector. And we're also seeing very good demand for build to rent in the Cork market as well. So to summarise all of that, um, I think we do need to be mindful of certain things. We're very bullish about another very strong year of activity in 2018, but we can't afford to be complacent about things like global and local economics, tax and politics. Um, our economy will perform well, but we have to focus on competitiveness hugely important, and we also need to avoid the capacity constraints that might appear as our population continues to increase and as we approach full employment. We really need to focus on infrastructure in particular. In relation to monetary policy, there will be an eventual unwinding of QE um, over the course of the next 12 months, and that in turn will lead to interest rate hikes, and that in turn will have implications for the market. So we do need to watch that very closely, watch what's happening in the US, watch what's happening in Europe. In terms of Brexit, we're obviously entering stage two of negotiations, so we have another 14 months at least of listening to what's going to happen with Brexit, and we're very lucky to have John McGrain from the British Irish Chamber with us this morning, who um, has been in the thick of it over the last 12 months in terms of 
observing what's happening with Brexit and we're very, very lucky to have him to give us a, an insight into that. But it's something we're going to have to be mindful of. And I think from a real estate perspective, the one thing we do need to keep at the back of our mind is that it's still a cycle. Um, we might be in an extended cycle, we might be enjoying the benefits of QE and the ultra low interest rates we've had, but it's still a cycle. Don't be fooled by people that say that it's different this time, or 3% is the new 4%, or it's a new paradigm. It's not, it's still a property cycle and it will continue to follow the same pattern. But having said all of that, all those things we need to be mindful of and watchful of, the investment thesis for Ireland is still very strong. Our economic backdrop couldn't be better. Our occupier activity remains robust in all three sectors, and in particular in offices, and it is encouraging to see that filtering out beyond Dublin now as well. In our view, development is well controlled. It's something we need to be very mindful of. We don't need to see oversupplying starting to happen, but as of now, it appears to be very well controlled. And yields, compared to what we're seeing throughout the rest of Europe, which are at all-time lows, our yields in all sectors are still above where they were at the previous peak. So having said all of that, um, we're very confident that 2018 is, is going to be another good year. There will be opportunities for investors developers, occupiers, funders, solicitors, I've probably forgotten some people, but hopefully property consultants as well. And on that note, I'll pass you over to John McGrain, Director General of the British Irish Chamber. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you very much to Enda and to Marie. Um, and it's fantastic to be in a conversation that starts out with such great positivity and a, such a constructive outlook on where we're at and where we're starting into the next phase from. We're in the business of never wasting a good crisis. And to, like contrary to the old yarn about if I was going from here to there, I wouldn't start from here. We would start from exactly here. And the, the, uh, the layout that uh, Marie has just put in front of us uh, tells us that we shouldn't we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't enter into what's coming down the track next with trepidation, but with the sense that we're well able for what's coming at us, because there's quite a lot coming at us. When, when uh, actually, on the day after the referendum in 2016, uh, Lord Mayor Brendan Carr, who was Dublin Air's Lord Mayor at the time, rang me and said, Johnny, can we get some work done quickly to pitch Dublin to the rest of the world? Because, because we need to tell people that we're open for business. And I rang Marie, and she said immediately, we, we want to help you with that. And we produced together a piece of work called Greater Dublin's Greater Than Ever. And that went viral, as they say. Uh, we produced a pamphlet and a brilliant piece of video that's up on the BritishIrishChamber.com's website, if you haven't seen it so far. And CBRE have always been such a constructive and positive partner to work with. It's brilliant. Uh, when Marie and Enda got in touch with me a couple of months back with their typically uh, military precision in planning this uh, annual uh, set-piece event and said, John, would you come along and talk about the state of play on Brexit uh, in the first week of January? I said, Marie, there'd be nothing to see in the first week of January. It'd be all over by then. Unfortunately, <clears throat> we got our timing slightly premature, and I'm afraid this gift is going to keep giving for a little while yet. Let's talk about Brexit, and, and as Marie said, if you're not already sick to death of it, um, you know, briefly, Brexit, discuss. Uh, in what was either the greatest act of democratic expression or the greatest political gamble ever conducted by a civilized country in modern times. On the 23rd of June, 2016, our great friends, the people of the United Kingdom, voted to leave the world's largest single unified trading zone, the European Union, as you know. And in doing so, the UK took back control of which foot to shoot itself in and promptly shot itself in ours. Because the foreign exchange markets, which are usually pretty smart, uh, believed that the UK would be worse off outside the EU and immediately reduced the value of the pound sterling, as you know, by 17%. And so the first people affected were not actually in the UK at all. They were exporters to the UK for whom sterling immediately went down in value. And as a result, businesses like Irish mushroom farmers and others were extremely badly hit, and some of them went bust. But UK exports actually went up, as you know, because they became temporarily, and that's very important, more competitive. Add in the fact that UK politics has delayed all the way to today still without 
yet telling us exactly what sort of Brexit it actually wants. And you have a situation where many people in the UK actually feel that Brexit is going rather well so far. Uh, and, there, and many are saying, as you know, why are we not yet out? What are we waiting for? The reality, of course, is extremely different. And the UK government knows perfectly well, for instance, that the UK economy is not doing well. In fact, investment is slowing down, debt is up both at state and consumer levels. The, you've a good chancellor with a bad hand. There's no money in the system to subsidise or soften the effects of Brexit that's coming down the track. And retailers, particularly food retailers, are under huge pressure, and we work with many of them, to pent up price increases that can't yet be released to consumers because the discounters will, are positioned to pick up that trade. And what you've got is Irish food being sold into the UK still at a reference price of 82p. I mean, sterling hasn't been 82p for well over a year. And as a result, you have massive price pressure and margin pressure building up in the supply chain behind that. That has to release at some point, and our worry is that it will release in Q2 to Q3 of this year, which may be too late to change sentiment in the UK, because unfortunately consumers who will be hit with price increases will slow down consumption, and they'll blame those nasty Europeans in the first instance, rather than necessarily change political sentiment around. That will come, but it may come too late. And the reality as well is that the UK government knows that it's got nowhere in its efforts to um, actually find independent trade deals around the rest of the world. The Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, a great person, was in this town six weeks ago and I had the opportunity to ask him personally, can you tell me, sir, exactly which country in the world the UK would like to trade independently with that it doesn't already have a, have a deal, a very valuable deal to trade through the EU or soon will and that's worth any money? And he said, yes, the United States of America. So I think there is a certain amount of cognitive dissonance in the system that still needs to be worked out in UK politics to help people understand that the UK already has trade deals with the greater part of the world's trade, and indeed on, on deals still being still in the pipeline that the EU will conclude, four-fifths of the world's trade available to the EU, to the UK, will be, will be done by it through its membership of the EU. That's a political point. It's still going to take some considerable time uh, to, to get to the rational uh, outcome from that. The, the second thing in this regard is that the UK knows that it, it has got precisely nothing at all from the negotiations so far. So we're well into the, the second year of the process and the clock is ticking down to the final phase of the process actually in its current terms. And the UK can see that the EU has set 100% of the agenda and kept control of that and, and won everything that the EU wanted to, wanted to achieve in the process, notwithstanding tabloids and opinion and sentiment. And we work very closely with both the UK government and the Irish government, and UK officials are some of the best in the world, but they're in an impossible situation, and the EU is, is standing extremely firm on this. So if you think the EU is going to fold on some of these points, I'm afraid that is simply wrong. This isn't a negotiation. It's not a negotiation, it's a supplication, because when, if you're in a member in your golf club and you decide, I don't like this anymore, I'm just sick of it, I was never really comfortable with the way the place is run anyway, and I've gone up there to the committee on Wednesday, I'm gonna tell them, here's the keys, here's my ticket back, I don't need to play here anymore, I don't want to play here anymore, I don't like the rules, and you can have your membership. But by the way, I'd still like to play at 10 to 11 every Saturday, would that be okay? That's not a negotiation. And that's exactly the situation that the UK is in right now and it hasn't dawned on political opinion including on the Labour side that that this is not a winnable situation so we're in damage limitation we campaigned as the unique organization representing business interests on both islands for the UK to remain in the EU and work with us together with Ireland and other uh, like-minded nations to fix the EU European Union because it needs fixing from within. But we now respect the democratic outcome and we're working to achieve with our friends in the UK the least worst outcome. And while some of us might be tempted to look on in the UK with a certain amount of schadenfreude in our less diplomatic moments, the problem for us, of course, is that a bad outcome for the UK in all of this is a very bad outcome for Ireland. You know, you don't need me to tell you the correlation. You know, 65 billion euros of trade every year, two-way, 400,000 jobs, 1% fall in UK GDP correlates to 0.3% fall in Ireland, etc., etc. And the problem is that Brexit is already happening in the UK. This isn't some future political potential outcome. It's already happening. If you're in the food industry in the UK, 
European labour, which makes up 50% of workers in, the UK, in, in, in uh, UK food production and food processing, is already not coming back to work. Lettuce pickers in East Anglia, not because of Brexit, but because the currency is worth less. Their emigrants' remittances to Eastern Europe simply don't make sense anymore for them to do that. And that's not just in low-wage stuff. In mid-range mid engineering, and engineering in Britain is a very high-value industry, that's hugely populated with Eastern European engineers and scientists. They're not coming back. If, they, if you're in the university sector, which is obviously for education, but also for research, which in turn powers up huge inbound investment and external exports from UK uh, plants, uh, university professors holding funds from the EU are also finding it a chilly place and not so welcome anymore. And they're forming research partnerships with other universities in, in the EU, including hopefully with universities here. So the position is that we have to work very hard with our European friends to be sure that the punishment beating that some people might feel should be dished out to our UK friends is not how this ends up. And that's why the Irish government put in such a huge and thus far extremely successful effort in terms of the first round of the talks in protecting Ireland's interests in phase one, which led a few weeks ago to the promise that if all else fails, the UK will operate as if if we're a still a member of the single market and the customs union for the purposes of the border on the island of Ireland. But the way it had to be worded in Article 49 of and Article 50 of the joint report on the 15th of December was that effectively it means that the UK as a whole has positioned it itself with the default position of remaining exactly as it has been to date. That sounds potentially hopeful. The problem is it's a political promise which may or may not ever see the light of day. So what happens next? What does it all mean for us? Well, the current weeks are about firming up on the work done in the first phase to confirm the details of the UK's withdrawal arrangements from the EU, because it's going to withdraw. People will say, so would they vote again? Might it be reversed? A couple of observations. I spent exactly 50% of my time on the ground in London and the rest of the UK. The sentiment on the ground has barely moved at all for reasons about hedging and other things. Like 75% of the foreign exchange hedges that were in place in the UK on the day after the referendum on 24 June 16 were still in place on the 31st of January last year. They've only been burning off more recently. And that's why there's this delayed effect on UK consumers to a problem that that affected us much faster. The problem is that if they voted tomorrow morning, they would be largely as hung on this position as before, and nobody in British politics is prepared to take that risk right now. So the process continues to firm up on the withdrawal arrangements, and this is about finding agreement rapidly, because the clock is ticking, on the numerous thousands of laws and rules that the UK is currently subject to in return for having the benefits of EU membership, and the unwinding of those so as to let the UK go its own way. The UK wants to get in on, onto the detail of what the future trading arrangement uh, that it needs to have with the EU, e even if it doesn't know that yet, but it wants to start talking about it. And the huge number of technical regulations that all of that requires in the EU means the EU won't discuss this until actually after the, U the, uh, the UK has left, which means that that has to wait until 11 p.m. on the 29th of March, 2019, barely a year away, and meaning that the UK's first business day as a free, independent global power will be on April Fool's Day 2019. So, what all this needs is some way of knowing what way the UK and those who trade with it will be positioned in between the UK being out of the EU from next year and whatever actual new trading relationship commences. That's what we call, obviously, the transition phase. And so there's huge interest in getting the arrangements for this phase established as fast as possible now. That's the currently most urgent matter to be agreed, and it's not agreed at all. The UK says it wants two years, the EU says somewhat less, and we, we in business want, quote-unquote, as long as it takes, because any alternative to that means further uncertainty, moving from one to two to three stages, and in reality, disinvestment, underinvestment, non-proceeding with transactions, that, and probably actually accelerating uh, remobilization or, or, or shifting transactions, lift and shift transactions that, that, uh, that are, are currently being sat upon right now. And, and among the many themes in this area has been, you know, have we, have we over-talked ourselves into the opportunity for Ireland, for Dublin and the regions 
to attract UK business. We all were part of the process around financial services because of the regulatory imperative around their need to, do, to have a mitigation plan for Brexit. Those transactions had to be first up, best dressed, best executed. And, and Ireland, I think, has done well once we, we, we realised the, the sorts of business that we were geared to host in financial services and the realistic distribution of those opportunities across multiple competing towns. The next phase will be rather calmer, I think, in terms of, of seeing Ireland move more, at a more normal pace to set out its normal attraction stall. And Marie has, has talked about many of the reasons why this is a highly attractive place to base your business if you need to be based in, in, a, in, a, in a location alternative to the UK, and we'll come back to that. What does it all mean for us here, and what does it mean for you in your business? Well, firstly, let's talk about what it means for the EU, actually, just in case anybody's in any doubt. The loss of the UK to the EU, I mean, like most businesses, in fact, every business in this room would say, if I lost my, my second or third biggest customer or, or, or stakeholder, I would have a serious board discussion to talk about how, how did we let that happen and not see it coming. The EU doesn't think like that. The EU is about to lose the, its second largest member, arguably for now the sixth largest economy in the world. That will leave a hole in the budget, a hole in the EU's relationships with the rest of the world, a serious empty seat at a number of key committees and, and uh, protocols and agreements that the UK is an extraordinarily important par partner to. And in all the vitriol, and I and my colleague uh, from running our policy business, uh, Paul Lynham, and our, our research uh, lead uh, Katie Don, who produced our big principles for a strong Brexit partnership. If you haven't seen it yet, dial up BritishIrishChamber.com. We were in Brussels on the day of the joint statement, 15 December, and for two days before. The atmosphere in Brussels towards the UK right now is toxic. It's toxic, and there are no friends to the UK's cause in, 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 in the EU right now, bar Ireland, actually. In the rest of continental Europe, there are very few people who really care about what happens next. So we have to work extremely hard for our interests to, to see that the, that the deal that finally arises out of all of this not only doesn't damage excessively the UK, but, but, but damage us in the process, in the collateral crossfire. The UK itself, of course, is the biggest loser. Half of its imports and half of its exports are with the EU. Financial services from the City of London and beyond, the UK biggest service export. And if you want a, a, a betting prediction, uh, the EU knows exactly how to hurt the UK hardest, and that's in financial services. And if it does end up with a deal that's more or less looking like it used to look before, but they need to show some point of difference, keep an eye on financial services and, and some penalty around passporting or some, some segmentation of that sector. The UK's world-class research sector, I mentioned universities, that all of that is behind some of the loss that the UK is going to suffer now. They're, they're all being pitched at by competitors. And the reason it isn't resolved yet by the UK is that the government has painted itself obviously into a corner of promising a departure without having any idea of what hope it has of achieving credible terms of trade in the future. For now, the EU's position is that the only basis for a future deal is on one of the existing models. The EU doesn't do new, or so it says. So it says you've got to have like Canada or Norway, or we've actually proposed in our big principles, Turkey plus, see me after class. There are models by which the UK and the EU can do business, but the, UK, the EU is not minded to give any concessions right now. Canada plus, Norway minus will not give an outcome that's good for Ireland because they have borders. The UK would end up still paying and not saying. It would have quotas, it would have tariffs on certain selected items. Canada doesn't include all of financial services or all of food or all of aviation. You know this stuff. Those are not reference deals that will be acceptable to Ireland's needs in this, and we have to work very hard to be sure that a crafted deal that works for all is the outcome here. What it, all of it means for us is that we've got prolonged uncertainty. And Marie has touched on, on this to some degree, and we are in great shape to handle that. But uncertainty is not a friend to the process. It's particularly dangerous if you're in food, not the primary concern of this audience today, although Paul and myself are meeting with the food industry later on, and they are in some cases existentially threatened. You can't lift a pig farm. You can't lift a 
a, a milk processing plant from one side of the border and put it on the other side of the border. The, the costs, the technologies, the regulations, everything around that make a serious threat to food and people who depend on food. And remember, food is a nationwide highways and byways and parishes business that makes football teams and local insurance brokers and car dealers and makes their business work. So nobody's immune to what happens in that sector. And ditto in relation actually to the next most affected sector, which is tourism, a highways and byways business. And outside of the, the urban stuff, Britain, the Marie has, has rightly applauded uh, Tourism Ireland and the sector for a fantastic performance last year, but Britain is still half our tourism volume, and what is bad for them is bad for us. So it means that others thinking of doing business in Ireland and from Ireland, on the FDI side, for instance, will also be uncertain about what our relationship is with the UK, and that's a further break. And the clock is ticking, raising the very real risk, I'm not doom-mongering here, but we need to be real. There's a very real risk of a timing out of the discussions and a hard or at least very disruptive Brexit. So, while we might get a good turn of events yet, we might, anything is possible in political life, we very well may not. So that's why there's no room for any complacency after the joint statement, no matter how successful that work was. And the complexity of what's coming next is significantly greater than it was in the first phase. So our first priority and your, your need is to know what the transition environment is. We want the status quo for as long as it takes. That might be in perpetuity, but we certainly want to know that that will be the basis. Uh, be and we need to know that within the next number of weeks, because that arrangement needs to be signed off effectively by this autumn to go through the administrative and political processes necessary for a final date of 29 March 2019, as is the rule. What does it mean for the question you want to ask yourself? How does it affect your business? What can and should you be doing now? Well, in the context of the property sector in Ireland, the question on everybody's mind is will we see more UK businesses and others from other countries looking to establish here? In our view, the answer is a definite yes, of course. The initial focus, as I said, was on London banks and insurers and other financial services, and the IDA and Enterprise Ireland and the agencies have done a spectacularly good job matching the work of our politicians and diplomats and officials, and we have to redouble all of that effort now. The next phase will see a steadier pace, as I said. We, I, I give you an example. We are seeing people talking about, about uh, the commercial side that Marie alluded to. Uh, we're seeing people in the UK say, we've got a distribution license from Hong Kong for the line of product that's coming into Europe via the UK. It mightn't even touch down in the UK, but the license is held in the UK for UK, Ireland, and the EU. Those licenses will get renegotiated for people who, to hold them elsewhere in the EU. And Ireland is extremely well placed, and Irish ent entrepreneurs are extremely well placed to avail of those opportunities, to redomicile UK business into here, to look at what the UK exports to the EU and see how can Irish suppliers uh, stand in the shoes of those, to look at what the UK imports from other places and see how can Irish suppliers make that stuff for the UK. Next week I'm at the opening in Burton-on-Trent of a business bought by an Irish business, a Dublin business, whose instinctive reaction after the referendum was to say there'll be value in Britain. And that guy will open a brand new business for, for the businesses he bought, I ran about a 40% discount to their pre-referendum valuation on the slump in sterling and on a reduction in asset prices outside, outside the, the London area. So there are those opportunities in both directions and we should be mindful of them and help people to identify them and respond to them. It makes Ireland highly attractive, whether on ease of access or commute, not least with the unique attractions of the common travel area, our common language, more or less, and legal systems and cost affordability. But that's assuming we actually remain affordable, that we remain competitive, that we do have easy access, and that we can use UK labour for services sold in the EU, to the EU, and that we do, of course, have houses to house them all. I can tell you, there are too many people outside Ireland, many of them in London, many of them Irish, who haven't been back in a while, spinning against Dublin and Ireland. It's shocking the amount of people who will say, you couldn't go there because they don't have any offices. Well, we've been long past that. They don't have any transportation. We've, we've just removed the only hard border on the island between the north side of Dublin and the south side of Dublin with the Lewis connector, for God's sake. So like, like the spinning has to stop but we're serious on housing. We have to get back out and, and, and tell the stories. Dennis, Dennis Bergen and others in the room were telling me about the, the actual transactions happening on housing. We need, need to tell those stories and tell them now. 
On the downside, there's no doubt that a hard Brexit will have a very serious effect on food, as I've said, and also, I think, on hotels and other tourism facilities. And any upside from increased demand for customs clearance services will be offset, notwithstanding Eamon O'Reilly's word this morning, and Eamon's a fantastic guy, offset by an almost total lack of portside land and facilities, not just in Dublin, but in other key port uh, assets, to accommodate the huge disruption and delays to our import and export freight business. Closer to home, we need to make sure that we don't waste a good crisis and to be sure we're building domestically on the basis to be and stay globally competitive, running our national finance as well, building the resources needed for a strong trading community from planning laws, traffic, logistics, and accelerating rather than slowing down the rollout of truly national broadband, for instance. This is, this is the gift that never gives and we need to actually get on with that and tell people that it's done. We should also use this good crisis to dream big and execute big on long-term enablers of our success globally, such as our education system. And my colleague Paul Lynham has done a lot of work with the Irish universities and UK universities to look at what is holding us back from implementing things like the Castles Report and actually funding a university system that's globally competitive, for, which, which in, in the Whitaker era was part of the way forward, and we need to get back to that visioning now. Very lastly, rather than send you home believing the world is going to end, which it certainly is not, let me remind us all that for many, not all, but certainly many straightforward businesses outside of the most exposed sectors, for us at the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, we always remind people that you can start now to Brexit-proof your business in just three and a half steps. Number one, give up that stuff about saying, I don't need to cover my foreign exchange risk. When I was in the banking business, but I'm okay now, the, um, the mantra was, so what would you want to be covering your foreign exchange for? You can make a pile of money if you don't. I'm afraid that's done and gone. The, the experience of the last, last two years, uh, if, ever, if anybody needs an example, says you shouldn't be doing that. So we need to, need to get, get into the hedging of exchange risk because it's very volatile right now. Second thing is, if you're an Irish business, don't get locked out of the huge UK market. UK isn't going to go out of business anytime soon. My patron, Niall Fitzgerald, patron of the chamber, has a very clear analysis. No, the UK isn't going to close down. Why would it? But what will happen is that over time, people will look back in 15 and 20 years and notice that there was really minimal new investment in the UK. And it will become smaller by being more isolated. We hate to say that, but that's, that's where it's pointed unless somebody turns this around. The reality is that will still offer significant opportunities for Irish trade, services and goods, and talent to do business in the UK as perhaps the UK's best trading partner. And we need to think about that. And you can very simply assure your position there by establishing whether boots on the ground, a JV, a license, a partnership, whatever, and we can help you with the contacts to give effect to that, working with our friends at Enterprise Ireland, UK Trade and Investment, and others. Number three, if you're British or you know a friend in Britain, don't get them, let them get locked out of the hugely valuable EU market, which is just going to get stronger and stronger as a market. And we can very easily solve that problem, not by having them closed down, but by doing a, a, an opening for them in this market here, the best access point for them into the future EU market. And again, we're working very closely with UK businesses to connect them to real partners here that can, that, that can help them to achieve that. And very lastly, item three and a half, the three and a half step to Brexit proofing your businesses. Don't believe the future will happen to you. You're in control of this. The voice and voices in this room, the political advocacy, the, the inputs that the government here and the EU and others want to hear from business actually, which has been constrained for all sorts of structural reasons. The, the, the voice of business and the voice of entrepreneurs is extremely important in shaping the final outcome of this deal. And people like us at, at Chamber of Commerce level and many other organisations are in the business of filtering those viewpoints, your viewpoints, back up to policymakers and politicians so that you can have an impact on how this ends. So on that reasonably constructive note, um, for those of you who think Brexit has gone away, I'm afraid it hasn't gone away just yet, but this is the crisis that we shouldn't waste. Thanks very much for listening to us. We'd be glad to help you along the way. Thanks very much, John. Uh, really, really insightful there, uh, message on, on Brexit. Also to uh, my colleague Marie, huge thanks. Fantastic presentation again. Many of you will be aware that uh, Marie was, uh, won the award for uh, Business Person of the Year, the Image Person of the Year award last year. Fantastic recognition for the great work that Marie has been doing in the property industry. So, without any further ado, thank you once again for coming this morning. We we'll very much look forward to working with you in 2018 in what looks to be a very exciting year. Thank you very much. <laughs>